Engagement Coordinator here at Dysautonomia International, and I have the honor to host this webinar today. We have a few housekeeping notes before we begin. Your video and microphones are not going to be enabled during the Zoom webinar. Uh, if you would like to use closed captioning, refer to the bottom of your Zoom screen and choose the CC Live Transcript option. You can choose how you wish to view the closed captioning on your personal device. And if you wish to turn that off, there is a small area next to the CC button. Just choose Hide Subtitles. You can type questions for our guest speaker using the Zoom Q&A tool. Just please keep your questions relevant to the topic being discussed and general in nature. We're unable to address personal medical advice questions. And please do not share any uh, confidential information in your questions, as the whole audience may see your name and your question if it's answered. We recently announced that we will be holding our 2023 Dysautonomia International Conference in person in Washington, D.C. this summer. Woo, we are so excited. And that will be from July 13th through 16th, followed by a lobby day on Capitol Hill on the 17th. Uh, we hope that you can join us. And if you're not able to attend in person, there will be an option to participate virtually. More details are going to be coming out soon. I know everybody's really excited. Uh, stay tuned into our social media and make sure that you're signed up for our mailing list to stay in the loop. And a quick note related to the topic today. So the word stress has several different connotations. When we refer to stress today, we're really meaning physical stress that activates your sympathetic nervous system, not necessarily the emotional stressors that sometimes can be associated with stress. Um, and Belin, Belin will go into more detail on that, too, in her talk. Uh, without further ado, let me introduce you to our speaker today. So Belin Rodriguez is 29 years old, born in Bern, Switzerland, and still living there. She has studied psychology at the universities Basel and Bern, with a focus on neuropsychology. Belin has written her master thesis on brain fog and POTS, and is currently pursuing a PhD in neuroscience with a focus on the autonomic nervous system, particularly POTS. Welcome, Belen. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to today's webinar. My name is Belen, and I will present today our most recent study in which we investigated if brain fog and postural tachycardia syndrome may be associated with autonomic hyperarousal or simply put stress. Now, while most of you already probably know what postural tachycardia syndrome is, I still would like to give a short introduction into the field um, in case there is someone that is not 100% um, confident in the topic. So the postural tachycardia syndrome is a disorder of the autonomic nervous system uh, that usually affects the function of multiple organ systems. A typical patient with postural tachycardia syndrome is young and female. Now the exact prevalence of the disorder is um, not known currently, but several research groups suggest that the prevalence ranges between 0.2 to 1% of the population. So it's not really a rare disease uh, like everyone or most people say it is. Good, so now to uh, properly understand what postural tachycardia syndrome is and how the disorder occurs, we have um, first to take a look at the autonomic nervous system. Now the autonomic nervous system consists of uh, the central nervous system and the peripheral um, nervous system. The uh, central nervous system um, involves the brain and the spinal cord. And um, in the central nervous system, the areas like the amygdala, the insular cortex, the hypothalamus of the limbic system, as well as several areas of the brainstem are involved in autonomic control. Now in the, um, the peripheral nervous system is divided into two parts, the parasympathetic part, which is known as the rest and digest part, and the sympathetic nervous system, which is known as the fight or flight part. And all these um, components of the autonomic nervous system autonomously, that's where the name comes from, um, control many functions of the body. Now, important functions of the parasympathetic nervous system are, for example, the beat-to-beat -beat control of the heart rate, 
um, control of the motility of the digestive tract and um, erectile function and important um, functions of the sympathetic nervous system are um, local regulation of blood flow, um, maintenance of the blood pressure, uh, regulation of body temperature and responses to stress amongst other functions. Now the um, parasympathetic nervous system does uh, its communication with the neurotransmitter acetylcholine. I'm not sure how to pronounce it correctly in English, but I'm going to go with acetylcholine. Um, and the neurotransmitter is some sort of chemical uh, substance messenger um, that is used for communication between the nerves and between the nerve and the target organ. So for example, here the heart or the stomach. And the main neurotransmitter of the sympathetic nervous system is called norepinephrine, with the exception for uh, the control of the sweat glands, which is um, controlled by acetylcholine. Now, in patients with postural tachycardia syndrome, mainly the functions of the sympathetic nervous system are impaired, but in some patients, also functions of the parasympathetic nervous system are um, affected. To diagnose a patient with postural tachycardia syndrome, an active standing test or a tilt table examination is needed. Now, in this picture here, you see our lab with a, a model, <laughs> it's not a patient, um, on the tilt table, which is currently uh, tilted to a 60 degree upright body position. And the first diagnostic criterion says that um, in this position or during active standing, the patient has to have an increase of the heart rate of at least 30 beats per minute or an absolute heart rate of at least 120 beats per minute within um, 10 minutes of this uh, position, either active standing or head up tilt. So during this position, you can see here on this graph that the heart rate increases rapidly and stays up, 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 up until the end of the head up tilt phase. And um, importantly, during this phase, uh, the patient needs to have his uh, blood pressure controlled, so there is no dip uh, in blood pressure. Um, if you want to fulfill the diagnostic criteria for POTS. Um, and then lastly, the patient has to report having chronic symptoms of orthostatic intolerance for at least uh, three months. Now, during um, this position or during standing, you can observe in many patients that their legs change dramatically their color. So here we see this in the legs that they change their color to some sort of bluish red discoloration that feels cold when you touch it. And um, this is a consequence of the disturbed um, local regulation of the blood flow that is controlled by the sympathetic nervous system. So the patient loses a lot of blood to the legs that um, is actually needed for the brain. And as a reaction, um, we have this reflex tachycardia. So the heart beats um, a lot to compensate for the blood loss um, to the under extremities of the patients, to the lower extremities. Good. So typical symptoms in postural tachycardia syndrome are symptoms of orthostatic intolerance, which means that when the patient is lying down, that he is symptom free and only begins to have symptoms once he is in an upright body position. The most commonly reported symptoms of orthostatic intolerance are symptoms like dizziness or lightheadedness, nausea, or a general feeling of being unwell, palpitations or rapid heartbeat, and in the restlessness, headaches, blurred vision, and so on. There's many more. But patients typically also have some non orthostatic symptoms, such as fatigue, with or without sleep disturbances. Um, gastrointestinal symptoms, so digestive problems, uh, muscular symptoms such as pain and weakness, and or bladder dysfunction. In our project, which I'm presenting today, we focused on cognitive symptoms, so the brain fog, because this symptom is very, very common. Almost every patient reports having um, brain fog or difficulty thinking or slow thinking on a daily basis. 
And uh, this rather unspecific symptom can also be measured because um, several studies have found cognitive deficits, especially in higher cognitive functions, such as working memory. Now for a bit of background, um, working memory is part of the short-term um, memory and is the brain system for temporarily storing and managing the information that is required for um, complex tasks such as learning, reasoning, and comprehension. Examples for working memory are, um, for example, uh, taking notes in class, uh, following multi-step uh, directions or instructions, uh, remembering an argument uh, while you're waiting for the other person to finish their sentence, or uh, doing mental arithmetics. Important to note here is that um, all measured deficits were limited to the upright body position. So it's not that patients with postural tachycardia syndrome have cognitive problems. It is a functional um, deficit that changes with the body position. So the brain fog is only measurable when the patient is symptomatic in the upright body position. Why and how um, brain fog in postural tachycardia syndrome occurs remains unclear, unfortunately. Um, there have been several hypotheses proposed, but none of them have been clearly confirmed so far. Now, the reasons for uh, the project I'm presenting today are based on the findings of one of our previous studies, which was actually my master's thesis, so my first uh, project in postural tachycardia syndrome. Um, this study was called orthostatic cognitive dysfunction in postural tachycardia syndrome after rapid water drinking. And in this study, we uh, investigated the cognitive performance in patients with postural tachycardia syndrome and healthy control subjects. So all patients uh, fasted overnight, so they did not drink or eat for at least seven hours before uh, the start of the examination. Um, and patients did also not take their medication beforehand. And then uh, the examination started with the cognitive task in the supine position, which had a duration of 20 minutes. And then this was repeated in the upright head up tail 60 degree position. Uh, the exact same task was repeated. Afterwards, um, the patients were returned to the supine position and asked to drink 500 milliliters of water, so half a liter of still water uh, within five minutes, which was followed by a 20 minute break in the supine position. After the break, the whole first half of the experiment was repeated exactly the same. After both head up tilt phases, patients were and healthy subjects were asked to rate um, 10 possible symptoms on a scale of uh, zero to 10, which was then added up and gave us a subjective symptom score. Now, these are the most important results of the study. Um, I, give you, I will uh, give you a quick instruction how to interpret such uh, bar graphs because we're gonna encounter uh, many more. Um, now here you see in white, uh, the patients with postural tachycardia syndrome and in gray, the healthy control subjects. And we're seeing uh, the function of working memory by error rate. So how many mistakes the patient or the participant made. And the higher the bar, the worse is their performance. And uh, with these graphs, you want to look out for the little stars, which indicate that there is a significant difference or a significant effect between two conditions. For example, we see that here during the first head up tilt phase before water intake, patients made significantly more mistakes than healthy subjects in the same position, but also significantly more mistakes than their own performance in the supine position. So this one here. The most important finding is this one, where we see that the performance in working memory of patients was significantly better after water intake. So the deficit that was here before water intake was no longer there. So it was quite a dramatic effect. And this effect was uh, paralleled by a reduction in heart rate increase and also by a reduction in, in symptom experience. 
Now, the phenomenon that water intake leads to a slight rise in blood pressure and consequently to a reduction in heart rate is called the water-induced pressor response. How exactly this pressor response occurs is not entirely clear, but it is widely assumed that it is mediated by an increased activation of the sympathetic nervous system at the spinal level. Um, so to put it more simply, the water intake appears to um, activate the sympathetic nervous system more at the spinal level, increasing um, their effects on the target organ. So water intake appears to make the sympathetic nervous system work better or more efficiently, which in the case of postural tachycardia syndrome leads to a reduction in venous blood pooling because the regulation of blood flow is improved. Consequently, the heart rate doesn't have to be as high. And lastly, and ultimately, the patient is having less symptoms and less stress when he is upright and symptomatic. Now, based on this finding and the many studies that have shown that induction of acute stress of physical and psychosocial, so emotional nature in healthy individuals leads to impairment in working memory. Uh, this combination um, led us uh, to ask ourselves the question if maybe um, patients with postural tachycardia syndrome have brain fog because they are feeling stressed. So the same mechanism um, as in healthy individuals in these experiments, which led to the question if the increased sympathetic activity that patients with postural tachycardia syndrome have uh, interpreted as hyperarousal or stress may be an important underlying mechanism for the occurrence of brain fog. This leads me to the aims of our study, which I just mentioned the first. We wanted to investigate if sympathetic activity is associated with the occurrence of brain fog. And we did this uh, by investigating the cognitive performance of patients and healthy subjects in relation to norepinephrine release. Now, norepinephrine, if you remember, is um, an important neurotransmitter within the sympathetic nervous system and is also a stress hormone. So it's released um, when um, we are feeling stressed, but it's also released to activate the sympathetic nervous system. And so um, this measurement is a good indicator of acute stress. Then the second aim was to um, test the water, to test the effect of water intake on brain fog and norepinephrine release. Now, the study protocol of uh, the second study was very similar to um, the one in the first study with two little uh, differences. The first was that we did use a different cognitive test, which I will um, show you in the next slide. And the second um, difference was that during the last minute of the cognitive test, we did take a blood sample to measure the levels of stress hormones. And we did this exactly like um, the first study, four times, first in the supine and then in the upright position, water drinking and then break, and then repeat everything from the first half. Now, this was the cognitive task we used. Um, it was called sustained attention, which is a bit confusing because the test actually measures mainly the function of working memory, but yeah, um, I'm not sure why they called it sustained attention, but it measures actually uh, the function of working memory. And we um, selected this test because it requires uh, the maintenance of the attention on a mentally demanding activity for a sustained period of time, which is a typical requirement in working life. So it's very um, near to the to the actual everyday um, demands that a patient or a normal person um, has to have. Um, right, so to quickly um, explain the task, um, the participants saw um, such a symbol one at a time for about half a second or a second or so, and then every 1.5 seconds, the symbol changed. 
and uh, you had to memorize the symbol, uh, the symbol you were seeing and press a button if the symbol you're seeing currently had either the same shape or the same color than the symbol that you saw before. So you had to uh, constantly update and memorize the symbols. And the test had a duration for 15 minutes, which was uh, quite long. And I tried it myself. It was uh, actually very hard to do. Good. Now I have here uh, an example of how such uh, an experiment with us looked like. This is a, a friend who was participating in the healthy control group. This where the photo was taken right at the end of the um, experiment. So the second head up tilt phase, you can see our um, tilt table and the monitor that was attached um, to the table that moved with the table. So we had always the same angle um, to look at the display. Um, the monitor was attached to my laptop there behind. There was me and I controlled uh, everything with the uh, the cognitive task and in one hand uh, she had the button to respond to the task and in the other there was a device that measured the blood pressure and the heart rate continuously so all the time and uh, very importantly i did not mention that before um, we inserted a cannula into the elbow of the patient and the healthy subject uh, right at the start of the um, experiment or the procedure um, and we took the blood samples from the cannula so no uh, poking during the test was necessary because norepinephrine as a stress hormone or a neurotransmitter associated with stress um, rises quickly if uh, we insert uh, pain such as inserting a needle in the arm so we inserted at the beginning a cannula and then could take the blood samples um, without or hardly without the patients noticing. So at least uh, without any pain associated. Yeah, I think that's all right. Yeah, it was during COVID, so everyone had masks on. Good, and now uh, what did we measure with uh, all of this? The cardiovascular measurements showed us the blood pressure and the heart rate, which were measured continuously. And of these, the heart rate is um, the most important one because as the, the diagnostic criteria say, the blood pressure has to be normal in order to um, classify as post tachycardia syndrome. And then the cognitive task. Uh, in the cognitive task, we measured um, the reaction time and the number of emissions. And a uh, number of emissions is the most important parameter um, for this part, um, because it is reflective of the working memory function. And omissions means that, um, the number of omissions mean that, mean how many um, target symbols were missed by participants. So if you had a symbol that was the same uh, shape or color than the one before and you didn't press and you missed it that's an omission so the more omissions um, they made the worse was their performance and then with the blood samples we determined the catecholamines catecholamines not sure um, which are the stress hormones um, and these are in first line epinephrine and norepinephrine whereas norepinephrine is the most important parameter as is it is the most indicative of acute stress and um, reacts the fastest to a stressor. Good, and then symptom ratings. Um, after both head up tilt phases, patients and um, healthy individuals were asked to rate these 10 symptoms on a scale of zero to 10. And these numbers were then added up and gave us a symptom score. But individually, um, this one was the most important symptom, which was difficulty concentrating, uh, which was brain fog. Now we are already at the results of the study. Um, just as in the first um, study, uh, patients with post tachycardia syndrome had a higher heart rate and more symptoms during head up tilt than healthy subjects. But 
both the heart rate and the symptoms were significantly reduced after water intake. So we have again the beneficial um, effect of water, not only on subjective symptoms, but also measurably on the heart rate. Here are the results of the cognitive task. We have a reaction time and omissions. We see here in yellow um, the control group and in green the patients with postural tachycardia syndrome. I suggest we look uh, straight at the omissions because it is way more important than reaction time for um, the working memory performance. And we see again as in the first study, we have um, more omissions, so uh, worse performance of patients in the upright position compared to the upright position of um, healthy subjects and also compared to their own performance in the supine position. This um, deficit was also present after water intake, but um, it was less pronounced. So we see that here, the effect or the difference has two stars and here it has one so the difference was smaller but nevertheless a bit there um, but overall we had a beneficial effect of water on the cognitive performance we see that because um, the reaction time was shorter for patients after water intake so they press the button a bit faster than before and the deficit in omissions was less pronounced after water intake compared to before. And then lastly, we also measured, or the program measured for us, the percentile ranks of um, emissions. And a percentile rank is, um, a, let me say this in an example. For example, the percentile rank of 50% says that the um, performance, which was here the average performance of patients, was um, the same or better compared to 50% of the standard population. So of people that were the, had the same educational background, the same age and the same sex as our um, patients. And with uh, these percentile ranks, we see that um, the performance um, during head up tilt before water intake was in the lower average range and after water intake, it was in the middle average range. But it is really um, interesting, or for me important to say that um, the performance of patients was never below average. So it was always um, in the average range, which is interesting, I think, because many patients um, tell us and told us in the study that they thought it was horrible, they couldn't concentrate at all. Um, and they felt like their performance was worse than it actually was because the performance stayed in the average range. It changed from the supine to the upright position, but it stayed in the average range. Good. And now this uh, deficit um, of the upright body position, so the um, impaired performance of working memory in the upright body position was associated with the symptom rating. So, the more symptoms a patient reported having, the worse was their performance in the cognitive task, which I think is made sense, but is an important finding. Now we go on to epinephrine. Um, and with this parameter, we see that uh, the epinephrine concentrations changed from the supine to the upright body position in both healthy, healthy subjects and um, patients with postural tachycardia syndrome before and after water intake, which is a normal response of the body because you need a different activation of the sympathetic nervous system um, when you're upright compared to when you're lying down. So there was no um, different reaction in patients compared to the healthy subjects. So it was for epinephrine a normal reaction in patients. Whereas in uh, norepinephrine, we also found that um, in patients as well as in healthy subjects, the norepinephrine concentrations increased upon the operate body position, both before and after water intake. But this time in uh, the case of the patients, norepinephrine increased um, 
more heavily uh, when they were changed to the upright body position. So the increase of norepinephrine was steeper in patients than in healthy control subjects. And uh, with norepinephrine, we also have a water effect. So the norepinephrine concentrations during the upright body position were significantly decreased after water intake. Yeah, um, which was um, the same as the heart rate and the symptoms and also in the cognitive task. With uh, norepinephrine, we had a bit of an unexpected finding. We found that um, patients with postural tachycardia syndrome always had um, higher norepinephrine concentrations compared to um, healthy subjects across all conditions, so independent of body position, which you see that each um, two bars, um, they have a significant difference. So the norepinephrine was always higher in patients compared to control subjects. So in summary, we can say that, or we found that um, patients with postural tachycardia syndrome have increased norepinephrine concentrations independent of body position, which excessively increased um, upon the upright body position and decrease after water drinking. Now this excessive increase of norepinephrine in the upright body position was associated with heart rate and the subjective symptom rating, which can be interpreted as the higher the norepinephrine was, the higher was the heart rate and the more symptoms a patient was reporting. Uh, the same was the case with the reduction in norepinephrine after water intake, which is associated with the reduction in symptoms. So the more the norepinephrine decreased after water intake, the more um, decreased the symptoms in patients with postural tachycardia syndrome. With this, we are already at the end of my results or our results of the study. Um, let me give you a quick summary. Uh, we can confirm that patients with postural tachycardia syndrome do have physician-dependent um, cognitive deficits in terms of working memory, at least, um, which means that patients do have measurable brain fog in the upright position, but only in the upright position. So it's not an absolute cognitive deficit that patients with postural tachycardia have. Um, it is only associated with the upright body position. And then second, we found that patients with postural tachycardia syndrome appear to have increased norepinephrine concentrations independent of body position, so also in the supine position, uh, which excessively increased um, with the upright body position. And then lastly, we showed that water intake reduces heart rate, symptoms in general, um, but specifically also brain fog and norepinephrine concentrations, and that all these factors are related with each other. Now, what actually causes brain fog? I'm afraid I cannot give a final answer to that question, it has to remain um, open for the moment, at least a bit open, because as um, there are probably um, multiple mechanisms involved in the occurrence of brain fog, as it is the case with um, most other phenomena in medicine, but our results um, point towards an association of uh, cognitive performance with the underlying level of activation of the sympathetic nervous system. So that, um, or simply to put it, that there seems to be an association of um, the occurrence of brain fog with the stress the patient is having when they are upright. There are um, quite a few possible mechanisms that could explain this association, but uh, these need further investigation in future studies. So um, there is an obvious need for um, the future and more research in postural tachycardia syndrome, which is um, indicated and needed. With uh, these words, I would like to close my talk and thank you all very much for your attention. And also thank you for the opportunity to be here tonight or today, wherever you are.
Um, thank you for the opportunity and thank you for your attention. Yeah, thank you so much, Phelan. Um, so can you take your slides down so they'll be able to see us a little yeah. bit better? Sure. Um, that was so interesting, all your research. And we've got a lot of really great questions about it. Uh, one mm -hmm. person wanted you to kind of just remind us, how much water did the people consume during the study? It was half a liter, 500 milliliters, so a small water bottle. Um, I have to say here that um, none of the included patients had um, severe gastroparesis. So they mm -hmm. had um, not that severe because we have one patient that wanted to participate but said she couldn't drink half a liter of water because it would come out again. So that I have to say that it's yeah. maybe not feasible for everyone, but in most cases it was uh, feasible. So yeah, yeah, it was 500 milliliters. That's a great distinction to make. We also had uh, multiple people that kind of talked about this this question of cognitive issues while you're seated versus standing. And it's really interesting that your study showed that those were really um, more excessive when standing. Um, someone mentioned Amanda Miller's research on brain fog that indicated that POTS patients do experience that when they're seated too. Um, so it's just interesting to hear all the different studies that have been done on that. And anecdotally uh, from our support groups, I see POTS patients all the time complaining of some level of cognitive uh, dysfunction mm -hmm. while seated. But I think the big distinction there is that it's excessively more when they're standing. Would you kind of agree with that? Yeah, I would say that lying down is the best. Sitting up is all right and standing is the worst. So I think I'm sure uh, we could also measure a deficit in the seated position, but it would be less pronounced than standing. And as mm -hmm. we have a small uh, sample size, I think it's the best to go for the most pronounced deficit, if you yeah. understand what I mean. But I'm sure yeah. the same um, is true for the seated position. Mm -hmm. I think most patients also would agree that seated is better than standing <laughs> definitely but yeah you don't there. see me standing up for this webinar for sure for that same reason <laughs> um yeah and then we had some people talking about um you know you did the study with just water have you thought about repeating the study with water with salt and seeing if that has a different mm -hmm. effect mm -hmm. well there is another study i think that um tested the effect of intravenous saline which is basically mm -hmm. water with salt. And um, this had the same effect on the heart rate and the subjective symptoms. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking that it will be about the same, but it may be worth trying. Yeah. I'll give it a think. I'll give it a think. <laughs> I don't know how nice it would be for participants to drink salt water mm -hmm. because it was quite a long experiment and mm -hmm. They were not exactly very happy with me <laughs> for uh, doing the same task four times in a row. So, Yeah, most of us get a little grumpy on a tilt table test. It's not the most fun test to have if you've got symptoms, for sure. Yeah, yeah. some, some said that it was a nice distraction uh -huh. to have a task. It's not just standing there. And some said it was very fatiguing and tiring. Yeah, so they you... Did... Did... No, they did great, so... Patients with post tachycardia syndrome, in our experience, are very, very motivated and participate in every study, regardless mm -hmm. of the <laughs> impact. Yeah. Uh, so your study was focused around POTS patients, and uh, this is a little bit speculative, but do you think uh, if this were to be repeated with other types of dysautonomia that you might see similar results? What kind of... Uh... Dysautonomia? Do you uh, like inappropriate sinus tachycardia or vasovagal syncope. Um, inappropriate sinus tachycardia, I don't know. I would have to research a bit. Um, there's a vagal syncope. Yeah, it depends on, on how well the general um, tolerance of the upright body position is. Because some patients with vasovagal mm -hmm. syncope, they're fine until it happens. <laughs> right. And some have some sort of, uh, or a tiny bit of orthostatic intolerance. So, I think the heterogeneity of this study group would be bigger than in post tachycardia syndrome. But I can imagine that if you have 
orthostatic intolerance without having foster tachycardia syndrome, there would be a similar change in norepinephrine and also the ability to concentrate, mm -hmm. I'd say, yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, someone was curious, did it matter the temperature of the water that you gave them? It was a uh, temperature of the room, so it was about 20 degrees and the uh, advantage of our uh, tiny lab was that it was temperature and humidity controlled. So mm. it was always the same temperature for everyone. Yeah, we didn't have a window <laughs> in this room. <laughs> so it was always the same temperature and it was room temperature, the water. Yeah. I suspect that they're asking that because some patients have reported that using cold water has been more effective for them. And some, you know, there's different opinions about whether room temperature water kind of gives you the mm. best bang for your buck when it comes to hydration versus room temp. Yeah, well, in the end, every patient has to work out what works best for them. But from a theoretical point of view, I think room temperature or at least not really cold water will work the best mm -hmm. because it is um, work for the body to then um, the, to compensate for the coldness of the water. But if you have a very hot body temperature, it may be beneficial for that as well. So it cools you down as patients with hot tachycardia syndrome often have a problem with a body, temperature, body temperature regulation. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah. There yeah. could be a follow-up study with cold and <laughs> warm water or lukewarm water. I don't know. So many different options for the future that are exciting. Our patients are really excited. Yeah, about yeah. Suggestions of study this, do this. Yeah, it's um, always the case. That if with one study, there you have so many results, and some make sense, some don't make sense, um, and then there's many more questions that pop up. So it's a never-ending loop, but it's a good never-ending loop. Absolutely. And we were discussing before this how difficult it can be to get funding for research too, which is part of why yeah, we're extremely. so passionate about extremely. fundraising here and funding that kind of research. Yeah. yeah, you're doing a great job. You're doing a great job because we are a team of two, two people. <laughs> we cannot acquire more personnel because mm -hmm. we don't have the money for it, but we would desperately need it. Yeah. So yeah. Um, someone else asked, um, kind of interesting, what your opinion would be about a tilt table test. So now that we know about this link with hydration, if people are being told to not consume any liquids before the tilt table test, mm -hmm. would that give more accurate data or is hydrating before a tilt table test kind of throwing off um, how severe yes. your POTS might be? Yes, it is. Yes. In our uh, clinical consultations, you come Fasted. So you don't drink or eat for at least seven hours prior to the examination um, so that we see the true autonomic nervous system. So we see the true control um, and the true um, impact of uh, the disturbance. So that's really important because in some patients that may not have a very impressive um, heart rate increase, which I, I'm a bit skeptical on the 30 beats mark because mm -hmm. um, we see that patients that have so this is not the scientifically speaking this is just from our experience that patients who have uh, lived with postal tachycardia syndrome very many very many years and left it untreated that they don't have this impressive increase in mm. heart rate so to come back to the question um if they drank water, it may be even less impressive to say so. So yeah. yes, it is uh, for us, in our case, it's very important that the patient doesn't drink or eat or takes medication beforehand. Mm -hmm. uh, sort of associated with that question, someone was talking about how there's not always access to a tilt table test in your area. Mm -hmm. And they kind of wanted your opinion on the NASA 10 minute lean test or on orth orthostatic vitals or the poor man's tilt table test that some people call it. Um, one thing I'd like to kind of throw into that conversation is a tilt table test, you're really strapped in. And so mm -hmm. you can't use the mechanisms that you as a patient have probably developed to adjust to your symptoms. You can't kind of sway from side mm -hmm. to side or make those adjustments that might help you not be as symptomatic. So I think that's one reason why the tilt table test is really a more effective option than doing just your orthostatic vitals. But do you have thoughts on kind of what's yeah. the best option if you don't have a tilt table test nearby? 
I think the best option would be a normal um, active standing test, so a Shalong test. But the patient needs to be standing still and not activate the muscle venous pump. And that's very difficult to, yeah. to do so. But I think if you are experienced with um, the field, with the postural tachycardia syndrome, and if you see the color changes in the legs and how the patient reacts, and feels and reports, you can see it also in an active standing test. But if you have access to a tail table, it is um, the most sensitive um, to detect yeah. a postural tachycardia syndrome, because as you said, you are in this weird 60 degree position, which is um, um, chosen uh, and not a 90 degree, because in this 60 degree position, you also don't activate or you don't have the need to activate your muscles mm -hmm. to be standing. You are upright, but you are theoretically also lying down. So mm -hmm. the whole work to maintain the blood pressure has to come from the autonomic nervous system. So mm -hmm. that's one reason. And then the second, yeah, you don't, yeah, you, you sh shouldn't try to move. You can move on a tilt table if you want <laughs> to, but <laughs> if you want, it, want to make the diagnosis and the, um detection easier then you you just leave it to the autonomic nervous system and if there is the case of uh syncope then we would uh, terminate the um, the examination yeah yeah yeah, and we would agree with that. Tilt table test is definitely the best way to go. Uh, if you don't know where to find someone in your area, our website has a great list of doctors that have tilt table tests and can help you out. Mm -hmm. Also, we have support groups uh, and on the support groups in Facebook, you can also find that information on the website. Uh, there are peer recommended provider lists there too that might be able to tell you who in your area could get that tilt table test, what's the closest mm -hmm. one. Um, so reach out to other patients mm -hmm. too and see they might be able to tell yeah. you who they've had success with. Yeah, we um, also had um, patients, new patients coming that did uh, an active standing test at home and brought with them the Excel sheet. So we had a bit of information how it was um, in a homey environment. Yeah, so that that may be helpful as well. If you test it at home mm -hmm. with a blood pressure device that you can get from the pharmacy, for example. Yeah. Yeah. Um, any idea why the control group had more omissions while lying down after the water intake? Any thoughts on that? Well, um, there weren't any significant changes. So we can't really say that there were more because it wasn't significant. But if um, we can speculate <laughs> that there was a tendency and you actually saw it in both supine um, positions that the supine position um, performance of healthy subjects was tenden tendentially, tendentially, tendentially. Uh -huh. um, in tendency it was uh, worse in the supine position compared to the upright position. And my personal thoughts are that they were very comfortable and a bit tired um, in the supine position and a bit more activated in the upright body position, which is also um, something I would have liked to discuss that um, the association of stress or arousal with uh, cognitive performance is thought to be an inverse U shape. So mm. there is a too high and too low arousal um, for um, the cognitive performance and cognitive performance is the best. So here on top, when the arousal is medium. So it could mm. be that the healthy subjects were on the lower end of the arousal when they were lying down and a bit more activated when they were standing. So yeah, that that's makes my, sense. Uh, my personal <laughs> theory <laughs> behind it. Thank you for explaining that so easily to understand as a patient too. I know yeah, people get excited and accessible. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, some other things people just thought were interesting about the study or that they'd like to kind of wonder if would have an impact is what if uh, the person was making kind of an important decision in the moment or something that has a little bit more high stakes to it? Uh, do you mm -hmm. suspect that then the numbers would also increase? Of the norepinephrine numbers? Yeah, norepinephrine and I guess also the brain fog. Do you think it would be worse if it's a more high stakes yeah. kind of stress? 
Yeah, I, there was a another publication, I think, of the group of Ocon, I think, mm -hmm. or Stuart, I'm not sure, <laughs> one of these, um, that show that have shown that um, the deficit in cognitive function, so the brain fog was more evident, the more complex, so the, the harder the task was. So mm -hmm. with a simpler task, the uh, deficit wasn't as pronounced as with the most uh, with the hardest task they had so maybe it's something similar that something that requires a lot of cognitive resources there you um, notice the deficit the most because you need the most resources yeah. and if it's something that stresses you you have from the emotional side already the increased norepinephrine and if you are a patient with postal tachycardia syndrome that already has too much norepinephrine um, then it may be even more excess so mm -hmm. from a theoretical point speculating yeah, <laughs> me, uh... yeah uh, we've got another thing for you to speculate on people are very interested okay. in the, uh, <laughs> so this was a rapid water drinking study do you, mm -hmm. what do you think would happen if that water was consumed more incrementally, slowly over time versus, do you think the rapidness is really making mm -hmm. an impact? Well, rapid, it's not one goal, it's five minutes. Yeah. It's manageable for, <laughs> for most. Um, but yes, uh, the bolus water drinking, so mm -hmm. big. So I think the guidelines say three to five, um, uh, deciliters so 300 to 500 milliliters of water within a short amount of time has the most effect on the autonomic nervous system so on the pers on the sympathetic um activity i'm not sure why i, I can't tell mm -hmm. you the theory behind it but it, it was shown that if you take it um like this like big portions in sh a short amount of time and then wait two to three hours and then repeat throughout the whole day that this has the best effect on the heart rate and on the symptoms of patients. So yeah. it's better to hydrate either way. If you can't take it in uh, within five minutes, then you can't. Then it's better to drink a bit the whole time, but the best effect you do have if you drink it fast. Okay. Yeah. Good to know. Uh do you know, I think you kind of mentioned this in your last slide, but do you know why the baseline for norepinephrine is higher in patients with POTS, or is that still something you think we need to investigate further? I think it's really worth investigating. I have my theories I can <laughs> um, share with you, but it's, you have to say that it's not um, scientifically shown, mm -hmm. so it's just what we thought it could be. So the first thought I had is not the reason, but a consequence. Um, when I saw these results, I thought to myself that there's no wonder that so many of these patients have trouble sleeping. If you have mm -hmm. increased norepinephrine independent of body position, there's it's not a big surprise that patients cannot sleep. There's not a proven association, but in my opinion, it is quite likely that there's some sort of association. And then um, the reason for the increased norepinephrine, well, one could be that the autonomic nervous system or patients with postural tachycardia syndrome may need a bit more time to regulate, so to calm down, mm -hmm. because the first um, measurement of uh, norepinephrine was taken around 45 minutes of supine position. So the installation of everything, and then we took a break after inserting the cannula and then the test, so it was around 45 minutes. And maybe that wasn't enough for mm -hmm. the sympathetic nervous system to completely calm down. And then the second um, explanation was um, that many of our patients in, the, um, in our cohort, they have an assumed etiology of postural tachycardia syndrome that is autoimmune, that is mm -hmm. immune mediated, which is now a bit of a problem because um, as many of you probably also know that the determination of these autoantibodies is not that specific as we hope to but nevertheless i me personally i'm quite convinced that there is in quite a big proportion of patients that there's some sort of immune mediated um, problem there and if this is the case then 
it would be quite logical that it is also here when you're lying down. Mm -hmm. So it, the autoantibodies, if there are autoantibodies, but let's assume there are, these are also present when you're lying down. So there is also a disturbed this func uh, function of the sympathetic nervous system while lying down, which um, becomes way more pronounced when you need the sympathetic system uh, more when you're upright. So yeah. that was the, our thoughts behind it. Of course, um, uh, investigating further, I think. But first, we do have to need to, uh, we need to, to have a accurate diagnostic test for these mm. things. So, yeah. Yeah, there's so many things we want to research next. It's, yeah, you know, whenever you find one answer, it's sort of like, oh, and then let's look at the next exactly. and lead to the exactly. next. Exactly. But I think there are quite some studies underway that investigate a bit more in this direction mm -hmm. of this uh, diagnosis of. Uh, autoantibodies and autoimmune, autoinflammatory, which I think it's really great that there are so many studies in this yeah. topic. Um, we also have somebody asking if there was a connection with blood pressure. So did you see that the water lowered people's blood pressure or had any effect on that in the study? So it didn't have any significant effect, but from the numbers you could see that the blood pressure uh, was a bit higher in everyone. Um, this effect of the, this is called the water-induced pressor response, and pressor means um, a rise, so you lift mm -hmm. it up. Um, and this effect is most uh, prominent in patients with some sort of autonomic dysfunction and also in old people, so in the elderly. Mm -hmm. um, and because the blood pressure is a bit higher, the heart rate doesn't need to be as high. So there is a reduction in heart rate because the blood pressure is slightly more high, higher. Yeah. Um, someone else is asking, do you think any water-based drink would have this effect? Like if they had a, a crystal light or a flavored water, uh, would that have the same effect? Or do you think it's really pure water is the best option? Well, we haven't tested it, but okay. I think pure water is the best, but as long as it doesn't have any caffeine in it or um, gas, so bubbly water, mm -hmm. because bubbly water is bad for the tummy, for those with a gastroparesis. Um, I think as long as it's only flavored, there shouldn't be any reason that it wouldn't work as well. Yeah. Yeah. And we have a lot of people asking about electrolytes in the questions. Um, yes, there's lots of research mm -hmm. showing that electrolytes are helpful for POTS patients. Yeah, and, I'm sure. Uh, that yeah. wasn't what this study was on, so that's why we're not really covering that so much. But uh, mm -hmm. but that is something that's been proven for patients. Yes, I think the still water is the most handy to everyone because many many the most most of the population have access. I hope mm -hmm. to. Um, the water so and it's also the most cost effective yeah and especially globally we've had a lot of conversations with people across the globe that might not have the same access to electrolyte products the way like people in the united yeah. states have yeah. so i think water is you know a great option for that yeah that, that's that's true that's it depends really on the regions which drinks are available and popular yeah yeah um, I think those are most of the questions. I also just wanted to make sure you knew patients are saying they're loving this, that you've done Thank a great you. job making it Thank really you. easy to understand. Yeah. And that it's really validating. As a patient, you can often see some doctors that aren't as educated and then feel sort of dismissed. And they're saying, oh, you're really validating that my symptoms are real. It's not just kind of made up or in my head and that this brain fog is a real thing I'm experiencing. So thank you for doing mm -hmm. that research. Yeah, no, no problem. That's also our experience that the understanding and being there and uh, acknowledging the patient is a big part of treatment. Yeah, so it's so important. really important to, that's uh, what our research is all about, to understand the patient and the underlying problem better so we can understand it better to treat the yeah. patient better. And uh, if you have any questions, you can write me an email also. So any of you out there. <laughs> All right. 
Um, and thank you so much for sharing your research. It's really interesting. Uh, for anyone who's tuned in, a recording of this webinar will be available. It usually takes a few weeks for us to edit it, and then it will be on our Vimeo and our YouTube accounts. Uh, and thank you if you're okay. able to join us today. Uh, yeah. Everyone, thank have you. Have a for great us. day, whether it's nighttime for you or the yes, middle of the day. It's now dinner time for me. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Okay. All right. Have a great thank day, you. everyone. Have a great day. Bye.